tells us about rights, but at the same time tells us about limits. Always in Islam, if there's rights, there's limits to offset, so you know where the limits are. Don't play with making something haram when it's not haram. If you examine what Islam really is teaching, and then examine what the condition really is. If we ignore reality, this is suicide. The person I'm trying to introduce you to you now has had, I don't know the latest figure, because the day before yesterday I knew that he had 1,800 websites, 1,800 his own personal websites. And uh, when I introduced him like that, he said he's gone to 1,806. So at that point I realized that overnight he bought six more Islamic websites and uh, he collects them like the way we collect our toys and things like that. So now, inshallah, he will be coming on stage. He will introduce you to some of his websites also. Please visit those websites. He has a stall downstairs where his wife is present and his daughter is present. You can collect his CDs and perhaps put some donation, inshallah, in the box downstairs also. Please welcome Sheikh Yusuf Estes, all the way from America. Wassalamu alaikum. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. Wa ala alihi wa sabi ajma'in, ashadu la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu in muhammadin abduhu rasul ma'abad. This is a very special day. It's a day for the Muslims when we go for Jummah, the Salah. It's also a day that, according to Islam, is more than just a little bit special. This is the day, Friday, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the very first human being, Adam alayhi salam, was created on Friday. Also, the day Friday for us is a day when we like to remember our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam more than any other day of the week. Because as we remember him and make dua for him, then this is something that is good for us and will really benefit us on the day of judgment, inshallah. So it's important, I think, to mention that Every Friday I try to remember to remind myself and all of the Muslims to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad. Let me hear you say that. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Fair. You need to work on that. Another thing that's important for us when we start talking about days of the week is to consider that we as Muslims today are living, a lot of us, we're living in non-Muslim countries. And that doesn't necessarily mean something bad, but it does mean something different. Whereas it is our, our day of worship where they have Sunday, and here we have Friday. So it's really like our end of the week, or maybe tomorrow the beginning of a new week for us, maybe, you know. So it feels kind of funny for us that this is our day, yet we still have to go to work. We have to do our thing, you know. A lot of times Muslims aren't able to get away from work to attend their religious duties. And that's kind of sad. So one of the things that we as educators, hopefully, Allah accept that from us, educators helping other educators and the presenters of Islam, one of the things that we should deal with, I believe, is some of the differences, similarities, and then the aspects that arise out of this for us as Muslims being in the West. It occurred to me that this was a great chance to deal with some of those issues. Man, I just mentioned one. Talking about Friday for us is what Sunday might be for Christians or Saturday might be for the Jews. Actually, there are some Christians. I don't know if you know this. There are some Christians called Seventh-day Adventists. And they celebrate their worship on Saturday. They uphold the commandment in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, and also in the book of Deuteronomy, 
where it calls on them in their fourth commandment, I believe it is, tells them that they have to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, that being the case, that Sabbath, I don't know if you know what the Sabbath means. Sabbath is from Hebrew, and it's very similar to the word Sabbath, which is in Arabic. How many of you know what is Sabbath? You know? It's the seventh number. If you said Wahid, Ithneen, Thalatha, Arba, Khams, Sitta, Sabbath, exactly. So that would be number seven. For them, and they understand it to mean that that's the seventh day of the week. And they're starting counting with Sunday being number one. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, boom, Saturday. So that's why some of the Christians uphold that and still worship on Saturday. But coming back to us, here we are having our day of worship on Fridays. What should we do? And what should we do about the many things that occur for us with regard to our religion living in other places other than not, you know, in Muslim countries. So this for us is something that's, it really is serious and at the same time it's not that difficult. It's a matter of understanding where you are and what's going on around you. For instance, I get a lot of emails on these questions and we deal with a lot. Somebody will write to me and say that I'm going to have to quit my job because my job is haram. And you're going, really? What's he doing? I thought maybe like he's selling pork, he's selling alcohol, you know, some horrible job. And I said, well, what is the job? Well, I need to know. He said, well, you know, because uh, I'm working in an engineering firm. I said, well, what are you doing that's haram in an engineering firm? He said, well, we design, you know, cages and things for uh, boxes. And I said, well, what's that get? why is it haram? He said, because they won't let me go pray on Friday, so my job is haram. I said, no, the job is not haram. The fact that they won't let you go pray on Friday is the only problem you've got. Let us deal with that. Don't just quit your job. Let us, let's see what we can do. So a brother came to me with this kind of problem one time. All we did, really, was to write an official letter on our stationery and send it to his boss. As soon as his boss got the letter, I got a phone call from the boss saying, we didn't know, we're very sorry, we want to accommodate religions, we thought he was just goofing around, the way he said that he had to go do something called guma or something, we had no idea what he was talking about. We didn't understand. Thought he was playing, but, you know, please accept our apology, whatever, if he needs the whole day off or part of the day, whatever you say, we, we don't want any problem. I went over there to his job site and I met with the man myself and talked to him and they were very accommodating. In another case, we had a brother who was you know, working. He just got out of prison and we were happy that he got a job right away as an athletic instructor in one of the local youth groups, a Christian youth group. And then he said his job is haram and he wants to quit. And I said, why? You know, one of the last thing I want to do is see an inmate who just got out of prison quit his job because he's going to have huge problems and have to explain a lot. And so I asked him, what's haram about your job? He said, well, because I'm a swim instructor, one of the things I do is teach swimming, I have to wear a bathing suit, and that's haram. I said, a bathing suit is haram for a boy? How? He said, well, somebody told me it was haram. I said, well, let's see. The bathing suit that he had does not reach his knees. We have something called the aura. You know the aura? should be covered from the navel to the knees on the men all the time. It should never expose any of that area in between the navel and knees. I said, well, let me go talk to your employer. And after a brief talk, he said, oh, my God, if it's your religion, it's not a problem. You can wear a longer garment. He said, you can wear a pair of blue jeans. I don't care. Just, just be sure that it covers a certain area, too. They don't want to have something that, you know, could be a problem. So I said, no, this, this is all. We just want to be sure that it's uh, covering the proper area. And they were said, well, we know that a lot of people will wear blue jeans and they cut them off and the strings get tied up in our filters in the pool and it's caused a problem. As long as he'll hem it really good, we don't care. So again, it solved the problem. I'm giving you a couple of examples just for you to think about it. A lot of the things that we see as a big deal, a big problem, our youth also see as a big problem. It's not that big of a deal if you examine 
what Islam really is teaching and then examine what the condition really is. All too often we try to make a problem where one doesn't exist. And in other cases there may be a bit of a problem, but it's not near the size or the magnitude that a lot of people want to, to present it as. Let's look at another case. People will ask us all the time about music. I'm going to ask you to think about something. Is music haram? Is it haram? Or no? Or maybe? Or somewhere in between? And in every group that I address, I can get all of these answers. Some will say, haram brother. Some will say, no problem. And then another group will be like, well, I sort of, kind of, I don't know. <laughs> Here's something to think about. I want you to put this in your mind when you think about our deen. Islam, as it involves us with the law, is our relationship with the law. And Islam, as it involves each other, is our relationship with each other. Even though it's clear that the word means our relationship with the law, because Allah has ordered us to have respect and give rights to others, then it also is how we are with each other. So our Islam is each other too. Let's look at that and think about it. Islam is teaching us there's a balance. You want your rights, don't you? You want your rights. You want your rights. You want yours, yours. Everybody wants his rights. You want yours, don't you? I'm a citizen of such and such a country. I want my rights. You hear people scream like that all the time. You hear people also say that, you know, I'm a woman. Ladies say that, not men. Shouldn't say that. <laughs> they say, I want my rights, women's rights. Yeah? And men want their rights. A driver going down the road, he wants his rights. The driver on the right has a right away. Is that it? So it's what we have in the States. So if you think about it, if all of us could have all of our rights, there would be a problem. According to me, what I want for my rights and what you want for your rights and you and you and you and everybody, we would want more really than what would be in a balance. That's why Islam tells us about rights, but at the same time tells us about limits. Always in Islam, if there's rights, there's limits to offset, so you know where the limits are. Got that? And all of the things that we're going to talk about in this little lecture are going to deal with that topic, about a balance between what's rights and what's limits. Think about this. Allah says in the Quran, and it's real clear when he talks to us. So you hear it every Friday. This being Friday, I'll bring it up to you again. The Imam almost always will read this to you from Sir An-Nisa. And then he'll read to you the very beginning of the fourth chapter of the Quran. And this, and most of you know the meaning of it, but I'll run over it real quick for the English. It's telling all the human beings, regardless if you're Muslim or not, to have respect and fear of your Lord, who created all of you from Adam, as we mentioned on Friday, and from Adam, his wife. So Eve comes out of Adam. She literally was a bone taken out by Allah and made into his mate. And from these two, Allah brought forth many men, many women. And then Allah says, and fear Allah. And he changes it from Rub, meaning Lord, to Allah, by whom you always demand your mutual rights. I want my rights. And that's our subject. That's why I mentioned that. Allah is the one... Everybody swears, when you go to court, for instance, you swear by God when you start out that you're going to tell the truth and you want your rights. Or you swear by God that you're innocent and you want your rights. Everybody is swearing by God and they want their rights. But very seldom you hear anybody say, I swear by God, I want this guy to have his rights too. You don't see that. If you went into court, could you imagine something? Uh, they would probably think you were nuts. 
to go in front of the judge and say, you know what, your honor, uh, my friend and I, we have a big dispute going on, but I want to be sure he gets his rights whether I get mine or not. I don't think anybody's going to say that, do you? Huh? I doubt it. Yet that's what Allah is asking us to do. Allah is asking us to give that kind of consideration in all things. So let's watch and think about it. In Islam, we have rights, we have limits, but all of these things have adjustments that can be made to them. All of it, except one. Allah's right to be worshipped alone without partners. This has no exceptions whatsoever. There's no exception to that rule. Always, all worship, devotion, thanksgiving, prayers, the salat, everything is only for Allah. Only. And there's no exception to that in any case. If that's violated, and Allah is clear on that, by the way, same chapter on Nisa, chapter 4, verse 48, I think, is where you'll find Allah says, He does not forgive people to make partners with him in worship. A shirk, but anything less than that he can forgive. And that's what I'm basing my talk on, is that subject. Anything less than that, Allah forgives. And in addition to that, he also provides for exceptions to rules. Let's look at a rule, just so that we don't have to drag this on and turn it into a seminar. It's just supposed to be a short talk. There's a rule in Islam that we take from the Quran many times, where Allah says, harama. It's forbidden, haram, for you to eat lahm khanzir, pork, pig meat, bacon, lard, or anything related to the pig and the pig's flesh. Don't eat it. Is that true? Muslims don't eat pork, and we know Jews also don't eat pork. We know that, right? What if there's nothing else to eat? What if there isn't anything else to eat and you will die? According to the Old Testament, I didn't find anything that allows that for the Jews. In fact, if they did it, they're considered unclean and they've made a big sin. They have to make expiation. They have to, you know, kick them out of the city for so many days or whatever. I don't know. But for us, if there wasn't anything else to eat and we ate it, would we be punished by Allah? No, because Islam is teaching us about the ruksa, concession that Allah makes during the time of durura, necessity. So, if there's a necessity in this case, no food, you can eat the pork. True? Yes or no? Yeah. And no sin on you. You don't have to make up for it. Nobody considers you went out of Islam. You became kafir. No. You ate. And you can eat all you want until other food becomes available. Yes? Just don't pig out. It helps if you laugh at these stupid jokes. I mean, it makes the day go quicker, okay? So, alhamdulillah. Now, let us consider some of the other things that are perhaps not as profound, but still there's something there. What about music? We're coming back to that. Is it forbidden in Islam or not? How will we know? Let us examine another proposition that comes along from Islam which teaches us that everything in the world, the worldly matters, is open for you unless it is specifically forbidden. Got that? That's one side of a coin. Remember, we said balance. What's the other side of the coin? The other side is that anything in worship, not the worldly matters, but worship matters, all of it's forbidden, except what you specifically have evidence for on the other side. Got it? So you cannot make up some way to worship Allah and think that he's going to like that when he clearly made it very evident for you in the Quran with his statement, Al-yawmul akmatu lakum dinukum wa atmamtu alaykum nitmati wa raditulukum islam ad That statement of Allah says, more or less to English, on this day have I perfected for you your way of life, often mistranslated as religion, but it's your whole way of life and have conferred upon you nitmati, my biggest nama, biggest favor, and have chosen for you to submit to me in true and complete peaceful submission, al-Islam. So therefore, because he said it's perfected, you can't add to it. Did Allah ask you in the Quran to make a special day every year to set aside 
for a birthday for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No? Oops. Well, Allah also told us in the Quran though, hold on, that we must follow the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and anything he says we have to take that too. Wa ati Allah wa ati Rasul, which means to obey Allah and obey his messenger. Many times in the Quran, كُنْتِنْ خَيْرَ أُمَّتِي نُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنَانَ أَنْهُ مُنْكَرَ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ. You know this one? This ayah is showing us very clearly that we call to everything right and righteous about Islam, forbid anything that's not Islam, or takes people out of Islam, and believe in Allah. But then, watch this, because it's in the same surah. It says, "Kul." Say, and it's telling Muhammad Sallallahu "Kul in kuntun tuhibun Allah fatabi uni yubukum Allah, wa yagfirukum the nubukum, Allahu kufurahim." How many of you memorized that one? You know that one? Anybody? What it says here: Say, O Muhammad, if you truly love Allah, follow me. Then and only then will Allah love you, and He will forgive your sins. He's the forgiver, the merciful. Putting that into place and in context, all of this together adds up to what? We have to follow Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he's telling us, do not do to me what the Christians did to my brother Jesus. You follow that? Do not eulogize. Do not set me up as somebody to worship like the Christians did to Jesus. And he calls him a brother because he's talking about in prophethood, not a physical brother, of course. So now, what did he mean by that? Did he mean that we shouldn't make a cross with Muhammad on it, Sallallahu? Well, of course, we wouldn't do that anyway. But it's more, isn't it? I've heard so many Muslims say statements that when I went to check it out with the real scholars of Islam, it was so bogus. That it was embarrassing to imagine that people would stand there with long beards and wearing, you know, their shawar kameez and stand up in front of a congregation, a jama'ah, and start preaching something. And then you go and check it out, and what they said was wrong. It isn't Islam. So, one of the things they will tell you is that the Prophet ﷺ is sinless. He doesn't have any sins at all. Have you heard this? Okay. And that everything he does, from the time he's born to the time he dies, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is absolute wahi, and there's absolutely no mistakes on his side. I've heard that. I've heard people say that. Now that means, according to the Quran, he's not a human being anymore. He becomes an angel. He's an angel. He's not a human. But the Quran clearly said that he is a human. And that Allah sent a human from amongst yourselves to give you this message. So now, which way am I going to go? Am I going to believe the Quran? Am I going to believe this Sheikh over here is telling me that the Prophet ﷺ is like an angel?